Let me invite you to turn in your Bibles to Romans chapter 12. Uh, we'll be in the last kind of chunk, the last paragraph of Romans 12 this morning, finishing up this mini-series we're, we're calling Be Transformed, which of course comes from the start of Romans chapter 12, where Paul encourages us to not be conformed to the pattern of this world, but to be transformed by the renewal of your mind. And so when you, when you zoom out and you look at the big picture of the book of Romans, what we see is for the first 11 chapters of the book, Paul is talking all about the marvelous grace of Christ. What Christ has done on our behalf to rescue and redeem sinners like you and I. For 11 chapters, he goes on about the grace that God has done. And then in verse tw or chapter 12, he shifts gears and starts talking about, okay, if all of this is true, here's how you should then respond. If all of this tr is true, if all of the grace of Christ is true in your life, then we respond through living differently, through being transformed. And so last week in the first part of chapter 12, Paul was asking this question. He asked, how does the love of Christ transform the way we love our brothers and sisters in Christ? So if we're transformed by Jesus, it's going to change the way we love each other within this family. We're going to aim to serve each other using spiritual gifts. We're going to aim to, to honor one another and to show each other hospitality. So that's what we looked at last week. But this week, Paul is going to ask an even harder question. How does the love of Christ transform the way we love our neighbors? It's one thing to, to, to love people who are similar to you, who have similar beliefs to you. That has its own challenges, but it's a whole lot harder to love people who are so different from you. And so that's where Paul heads next. Let me now read for us our text in Romans 12, verses 14 through 21. Would you hear now the word of the Lord and take heed how you listen? Bless those who persecute you. Bless and do not curse them. Rejoice with those who rejoice. Weep with those who weep. Live in harmony with one another. Do not be haughty, but associate with the lowly. Never be wise in your own sight. Repay no one evil for evil, but give thought to do what is honorable in the sight of all. If possible, so far as it depends on you, live peaceably with all. Beloved, never avenge yourselves, but leave it to the wrath of God, for it is written, vengeance is mine, I will repay, says the Lord. To the contrary, if your enemy is hungry, feed him. If he is thirsty, give him something to drink, for by so doing you will heap burning coals on his head. Do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. This is the word of the Lord. Amen. So again, last week, all about being transformed in our love for one another. But this passage, Paul is trying to show the early Christian church, especially those Christians in Rome, how are you supposed to love your neighbor when your neighbor is persecuting you? Right? He opens the passage with, bless those who persecute you. He's got persecution in mind. And so I, I think we need to, to talk about persecution for a moment. You know, in, in these early days of Christianity, these early Christians in Rome were facing just immense persecution almost immediately. And so Paul is going to address how the early Christian church is supposed to endure that persecution. But he's not merely going to give them advice for enduring persecution. He's got a greater goal in mind. He's going to say, here's how to endure persecution for the sake of Christ in a way that lifts high the gospel for your neighbors in a way that causes non-believers around you to see in your actions what Christ is doing in your heart. So even as the, the Roman church was experiencing persecution from Gentiles around them, the goal is to respond to that persecu persecution in a way that lifts high the gospel, in a way that brings more and more of those Gentiles into saving faith. So regardless of, of, of how those outside the church might be mistreating or maligning. The goal for us as believers is to respond in such a way 
where we can share the gospel and bring more of those people into the family of God. Paul actually gives away this point later on in Romans 15. He says, For I will not venture to speak of anything except what Christ has accomplished through me, and then catch this, to bring the Gentiles to obedience by word and deed. To bring those who are harming and seeking to persecute the church, to bring them into obedience with God's command, that they might share in the salvation that is ours. Now, I, I, I want us to be careful and a little bit discerning, a lot discerning, as we approach a text like this. It can, be, it can be tempting for some Christians to draw direct parallels between the early church and what they were facing and what we as the American church are facing. There can be a temptation to see some of the political unrest and popular movements in our country and, and think that we as the American church are facing the same kind of persecution that the early Roman church did. And I don't, I don't want to minimize the problems we're having as a country and how those might impact the church. But I think we need to, to pause and remember some of the severity of Christians around the world and the persecution that our brothers and sisters in Christ are facing in other areas. Just by way of example, um, Christians in Nigeria at this moment are facing violent persecution at the hands of Islamic extremists. They covered a, an 18-month period from 2021 to the middle of 2022, and in just 18 months, in the country of Nigeria, 7,600 Christians were murdered for their faith. North Korea, simply owning a Bible is basically a death sentence. Churches in China, to this day, are required to have signs up in their sanctuaries proclaiming their love and obedience to the Communist Party. Last year alone, it's estimated that 5,000 Christians were murdered for their faith around the world. Now, in God's providence, you and I don't live in a country where that persecution is happening. It's not to say the U.S. couldn't go down that road in the future. Lord willing, that will never be the case. But at least for now, in God's providence, that's not the kind of persecution that you and I face day to day in Northwest Indiana. So how do we then, as, as you know, believers in 2024 in this part of the world, how do we approach a text like this where Paul's giving advice and wisdom and exhortation to believers facing incredible persecution? I would suggest kind of three ways we need to approach this passage. First, this passage is a call for us to pray for the persecuted church around the world. We did that just a few moments ago in the pastoral prayer and at the end of the sermon, I'm going to pray again for Christians around the world facing persecution. But I would encourage you to make that a part of your regular, regular rhythms of prayer. Pray for your brothers and sisters in Christ around the world because the Lord knows they need our prayers. Okay, second way we need to approach this passage is to see it as a call to prepare. I mean, I'm not a prophet. I'm not a son of a prophet. I don't want to try to predict the future. But it's possible that great persecution could come for the church in America at some point in the future. Lord willing, it won't, but it could. And when it comes, if it comes, we need to be prepared to respond in the same way Paul calls us to respond in this passage. Third, this passage is a call to consider how we are to treat our non-Christian neighbors. Now, I'm using that term neighbors loosely. Um, a few months ago, I preached a sermon where I challenged you all to go pray in your neighborhoods and do a prayer walk in your neighborhoods. And several of you reminded me that your home is about a quarter mile away from your next neighbor and doing a prayer walk in your neighborhood gets you know, quite hot out in those country roads. So when I say the word, you know, be, be, preparing, uh, be praying for your neighbors, be loving your neighbors, what I mean is everyone you encounter on a day-to-day -day basis. Whether your physical neighbors in your neighborhood or your coworkers or the people you encounter at the grocery store, all of them are your neighbors if you walk past them, if you talk to them, if you see them. So this passage is a is a challenge for us to think about how we interact with those people. Even if our neighbors are not persecuting us, our aim is still the same as it was for the early Christian church. Our aim is to love our neighbors with the love of Christ so that they might come to know Jesus. Jesus. 
Whether they're persecuting us or whether they're just simply ambivalent towards us, our goal is for our non-Christian neighbors to hear the good news of the gospel and to become part of the family of God. That's our aim. So I think this passage, it's really a call for you and I today to live a life that displays the gospel. To live a life that lifts high the gospel, especially in how we love our neighbors. So let me give you kind of our outline for the rest of our time as we walk through the passage. Lifting high the gospel looks like three things. Lifting high the gospel looks like loving with humility. It looks like aiming to live peaceably. And third, lifting high the gospel looks like responding graciously with an eye towards evangelism. So first, lifting high the gospel looks like loving with humility. I want you to recall what Paul said a few verses earlier in Romans 12. You know, it's always good to see the greater context of a passage. So look in verse 3 where he says, By the grace given to me, I say to everyone among you, not to think of himself more highly than he ought to think, but to think with sober judgment. What he's saying is that the grace of God is going to cor- it's going to change our hearts. It's going to humble us. The grace of God working in the hearts of his people is going to cause us to see our sin, to see how we are prone to wander, and to see the great infinite love with which God has loved us. And that understanding is going to bring about just a deeper sense of humility in our hearts. There's a, there's a graphic we looked at last week um, this is called the, the cross chart. It came from a book called The Gospel-Centered Life. Uh, but, but this is meant to be kind of a timeline of your life, that, that as life goes on, there's a point of conversion where you first learn to trust in Jesus as your Savior. And in that moment, you start growing in two different ways. You start growing in your understanding of God and his holiness and his perfection. And you start growing in a deeper sense of your own weakness, your own frailty, and just how much you need a Savior. And then, of course, as you continue walking with Jesus, you grow in both those ways. You grow both in loving God more and an understanding of his perfection and an understanding of how much more you need a Savior. So this, this is what we're talking about when we say we've got to love with humility. As we love the Lord more, we've got to, to realize just how great it is that we have a Savior. And that's going to grow humility in us. It's going to transform the way that we love our neighbors. I want to give you three ways to love with humility that come from our text this morning. First, we are to humbly love by not showing partiality. By not showing partiality. This is what Paul says in the middle of verse 16. Do not be haughty, but associate with the lowly. Or do not be proud, or do not be concerned with your own right standing, but associate with those who are beneath you in social standing. What Paul is doing here is he's diagnosing something that was common in every culture. Whether for the early Roman Christians or for us today in America, what he's diagnosing is that it is, it's easy to be driven by status. It's easy to conduct yourself in in a way that you ignore some people and favor spending time with others so that you rise up in social standing. This is so common to us. It's, It's almost second nature. We don't realize that we're doing it when we turn a cold shoulder to somebody to focus on somebody that might lift us up a little bit. But Paul's saying that that should never be the case in the body of Christ. May it never be the case that we favor some people over others for our own selfish gain. Now, you might hear echoes of James chapter 2. But I want to read a, a kind of a bigger section of James chapter 2 where he gives a specific instruction to the early church as a warning, saying, this could happen, don't treat each other this way. Let me read it now. My brothers, show no partiality as you hold the faith in our Lord Jesus Christ, the Lord of glory. And he gives this example. For if a man wearing a gold ring and fine clothing comes into your assembly, and a poor man in shabby clothing also comes in, and if you pay attention to the one who wears the fine clothing and say, you sit here in a good place, while you say to the poor man, you stand over there, 
or you sit down at my feet? Have you not then made distinctions among yourselves and become judges with evil thoughts? If you really fulfill the royal law according to the scripture, which says, you shall love your neighbor as yourself, you are doing well. But then hear this warning. If you show partiality, you are committing sin and are convicted by the law as transgressors. Now that, that's quite a stark warning against partiality. And so if we as believers are supposed to you know, think about loving our neighbors with humility and lifting high the gospel in our communities, it's going to change the way that we interact with every one of our neighbors. This kind of humility is going to push us to to love our neighbors with great self-sacrifice, especially the ones that are the hardest to love. You think about that, that weird neighbor who everyone else is kind of afraid of, and when they see them outside, they jump to the other side of the street. Like We're called to associate with that person, to love them with the love of Jesus. Okay, so we are to humbly love by not showing partiality. Number two, we are to humbly love by empathizing. We can humbly love our neighbors by entering into their lives and celebrating their wins and mourning with them in their losses. Look at how Paul puts this in verse 15. Rejoice with those who rejoice. Weep with those who weep. Okay, rejoice with those who rejoice. When your neighbors are celebrating something, celebrate with them. Praise God along with them for how they've been blessed. Okay, so by way of application, Bears fans, can you rejoice with the Packers fans when they beat us? <laughs> you said no. Yeah, okay, that's too high of a bar. Okay, but then more seriously, Jesus says, or Paul says, weep with those who weep. This is where I think we can get really practical. To weep with those who weep. When our neighbors are mourning, when they walk through adversity, We've got a privilege to mirror what Jesus has done for us in how we love them. I mean, just recall in the Gospel of John when Lazarus died and all of Lazarus' friends are mourning his loss. You remember what Jesus did? He wept. He wept along with them. For those that are hurting, when we see our neighbors in trouble, sit with them, pray with them, I mean, be willing to just not have the right words to say. Just be there. Just showing up means so much. Okay, middle school and high school students, I want you to, to key in here for a second. I have no doubt that at some point in the next few years, you're going to have a friend who comes to you in tears. Some big problem just happened in their life, and they're crying, and for whatever reason, the Lord brings that friend to you, and they're crying to you and asking you for help. I want to give you a little wisdom here. Do not feel like you have to have the right words to comfort that person. Don't feel like you've got to solve their problems or or offer some great platitude of wisdom that will, will help them through their trouble. No, what you can do is what we're called to do here is to weep with those who weep. Third way we can humbly love is by leaning on the Lord's wisdom. At the end of verse 16, Paul writes, never be wise in your own sight. You think about earthly wisdom, wisdom from below. Selfish wisdom would never bother to weep with those who weep, would it? Selfish and earthly wisdom would only associate with those of a higher class so that we can rise up in social standing. But if we've been transformed by the gospel by the renewing of our minds, it's going to flip all of that on its head. We'll seek to be wise in the Lord's eyes, meaning we're going to follow his wisdom, even when earthly selfish wisdom would say that's foolish. You can think of Proverbs 3, 5 through 7. Trust in the Lord with all of your heart and do not lean on your own understanding. In all your ways acknowledge him and he will make your path straight. Do not be wise in your own eyes. Fear the Lord and turn away from evil. If we're going to humbly love our neighbor, it means we've got to lean on the Lord's wisdom. We've got to trust that his ways are better than our own. So when he calls us to to love those who are persecuting us, that doesn't make sense from an earthly standpoint. 
But from a heavenly standpoint, that's exactly what we're supposed to do. We need to trust that when he says to sacrifice your own comfort to love someone who's really, really hard to love, trust that that's worth it. And when we do that, it lifts high the gospel, doesn't it? When we follow God's wisdom, it's going to result in rejoicing with those who rejoice, in weeping with those who weep, in, in not showing partiality. Doing all of that is going to lift high the gospel. Let's look at our second heading. The lifting high the gospel looks like aiming to live peaceably. And that, of course, comes from verse 18 where Paul writes, If possible, so far as it depends on you, live peaceably with all. What a high bar is set for us in that passage. To live in such a way that promotes peace between you and your neighbor, or between you and your boss, or you and your coworker, or you and the other moms that you meet on the playground at the park playdates. Live peacefully with all of them. Promote peace whenever possible. Now it does say in that verse, as far as it depends on you. There are things that can happen that are outside of your control. But for whatever is within your control, respond with peace. Even when your crazy neighbor does something that really just irks you, respond peaceably. Be peacemakers. Remember what Jesus says in the Sermon on the Mount, blessed are the peacemakers. We are to be people who aim to live peaceably with all. Okay, but again, that's, that's a high bar. So how do we do that? How do we actually live peaceably? with our neighbors? How do we live peaceably with those who are trying to persecute us? Look back at verse 14. Bless those who persecute you. Bless and do not curse them. We are to seek to bless those who are against us, to pray for them and for their salvation. Now, I think Paul himself did this remarkably well throughout his ministry. He regularly sought to bless those who were persecuting him. You can think of the story in Acts chapter 16 where Paul and Silas had just healed the slave girl and then because they healed someone, they got put in prison. And then in prison, do you remember what they did? They prayed and they sang hymns and then the Lord opened an opportunity for them to share the gospel with the jailer, with the very person who was charged with keeping them in prison, they shared the gospel with that man and he came to believe in the Lord. Paul lived out verse 14, didn't he? We should aim to be loving our neighbor like that. He gives us another clue for living peaceably later on in verse 19. Beloved, never avenge yourselves, but leave it to the wrath of God. For it is written, vengeance is mine, I will repay, says the Lord. Don't seek revenge. Don't seek to get even. Now you might be saying, but you don't know my situation. I want to get vengeance. I've got something I can do that would really mess with the other person and level the playing field and make it even. Even then, we are to not take vengeance into our own hands. Now it's a good thing to want the world to be fair. Like, that is something that God has created in each and every one of us. God has wired us to want things to be made right when they're wrong. God has wired us to want to pursue justice. We should long for things to be made right, but we've got to trust that it's the Lord who does that work. Vengeance is mine, says the Lord, I will repay. We've got to trust that he will make all things right in the end. Now, I grew up as the youngest of four siblings, and if you've got a family with multiple kids, you know that things are not always fair, right? One sibling gets special treatment while the other one doesn't. I can remember my sister one day uh, for vacation, she and my mom got to fly to Florida while my dad and my brothers had to drive the whole way there, right? Life's not always fair, and I remember the, the refrain my mom would always say is that it all evens out in the end, And in some ways it does, some ways it doesn't. But we need to trust that God really will make all things right in the end. That God really will bring about full justice as he sees fit. We are not to take vengeance into our own hands, but to trust that the Lord will do it. Because remember, our aim is to, to lift high the gospel, 
Our aim is, to, is that the wrath of God coming for your neighbor because of their sin, our aim is for that wrath to be poured out on Jesus in their place. Our hope is that our neighbors would come to saving faith in Christ so that the wrath that they deserve is poured out on Jesus in their place. And one of my favorite songs that we sing is In Christ Alone. There's a line in that song that says, The wrath of God was satisfied, for every sin on him was laid. Here in the death of Christ I live. It's good and right that we sing that verse about ourselves that the wrath that we deserve because of our own sin was placed on Jesus. But do we desire for that to be true about our enemies? Do we earnestly desire for the wrath that they deserve to be transferred to Christ? This is why we are to bless them and not curse them. It should be our, our earnest desire for them to love Christ and to receive all of the blessings that come from knowing Jesus. Our right, third way, lifting high the gospel, looks like responding graciously with an eye toward evangelism. If we're seeking to lift high the gospel, it's going to look like responding with graciousness and kindness, even when that other person doesn't deserve it. He says this in verse 17, Repay no one evil for evil, but give thought to do what is honorable in the sight of all. We're commanded here to do something that is really remarkable, to not get revenge, but instead to give honor. When we've been wronged or when we've been hurt, it's not our job to get even, to get revenge, but rather to speak with kindness about our enemy, to honor them. Again, Paul is setting a remarkably high bar for us, but this this will lift high the gospel if we respond in that way, won't it? Or consider verse 20. To the contrary, he says, if your enemy is hungry, feed him. If he's thirsty, give him something to drink, for by so doing, you will heap burning coals on his head. Responding graciously means going the extra mile to help our enemy. Okay, this is countercultural in every culture. Whether in the early Roman culture or us today in Northwest Indiana in 2024, treating your enemies this way is remarkably countercultural. This doesn't make sense from an earthly perspective. This is one of those moments where we've got to trust that the Lord's wisdom is higher than ours. We've got to trust that he will make all things right. I want to talk just briefly about the end of verse 20. There's that, that weird phrase where it says, for by so doing, you will heap burning coals on his head. Because that certainly sounds like vengeance, right? Putting coals on someone's head so their hair catches on fire. Um, th this is a turn of phrase in the original Greek that we don't have a translation for in English. This is not a phrase that you and I use today. But I think when you look in the context of the thinking about persecution and responding with graciousness and kindness, I think that phrase, heaping burning coals on their head, means this. It means that when you love your enemy, it may cause them to feel some level of shame. That your kindness towards them, when it's contrasted with their hatred towards you, it might actually prick their conscience and cause them to rethink their ways. They might respond, who knows, by, by trusting in Christ. The Lord may use your kindness to convict them of their sins and cause them to trust in Jesus. After all, that's the goal, isn't it? The goal is for them to be welcomed into the family of God. A showing love for your enemy might just be the means through which God brings someone to salvation. So let our actions reflect that. Let our actions, the way we treat our enemies, reflect that truth. That we want them to know Jesus as we have come to know him. There's a popular quote that's uh, attributed to St. Francis of Assisi. We don't know if he actually said it, but the quote goes something like this. Preach the gospel at all times. Use words when necessary. And I get what that's going for, but I, I would want to rephrase that. Preach the gospel with your lives so that your words mean something. 
Let the way that you love your enemy display the gospel at work in your heart. Let the way that you interact with your neighbors reflect the truth of the gospel you hope to proclaim to them. And I think Paul sets up the book of Romans really intentionally the way he does. Especially Romans 12, he sets it up intentionally, thinking about first how we love each other within the body of Christ, and then he zooms out and looks at our neighbors. And and, and here's kind of the aim for us. The goal for us is that we should love our neighbor in the same way we seek to love one another within the body. Okay, so if you bring meals to other church members, please keep doing that. I love that. But let me challenge you to expand that out to your neighbors and bring meals to them. If you invite other church members over for dinner in your home, keep doing that. But could you do that for your neighbors as well? If you seek to show hospitality towards newcomers who come in these doors into our church, could you also show hospitality to the new neighbors that are coming and moving into your neighborhood? Verse 21 says, do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. Think about the way that you can overcome evil with good by lifting high the name of Jesus. Whether your neighbor is persecuting you or whether they're hardly ever acknowledging that you exist, living a life, as Paul lays out in Romans 12, is going to lift high the gospel. And who knows how how your actions might work in the hearts of your neighbors, might win them over to the gospel. Now, Paul all throughout has been setting a really high bar. And we should all be ready to admit that we will fail at this. We will fail to perfectly love our neighbor as ourself. We will fail to perfectly show hospitality or to respond in kindness. You will likely at some point do something that harms your neighbor instead of living peaceably with them. We're all, myself included, going to fail at this. So let me remind you of of, of two things, really. First is to remind you of the way the book of Romans is set up. You get 11 chapters of the grace and mercy of God poured out for you. Chapter 12 is how you respond to that. You respond with kindness. You respond with love towards your enemy. And when you fail at that, I want to remind you of a quote from Richard Sibbs who says this, There is more mercy in Christ than sin in us. There's more mercy in Christ than there is sin in you. The transforming grace of Christ is more than enough to cover the weight of your sins and your mistakes. Even when you lose patience with your neighbor and respond in anger, even then there's more mercy in Christ than there is sin in you. Even still, there's more mercy in In Christ. So keep drawing from that well. Keep drawing from the strength that's offered to you in the gospel. I want to close with an illustration that uh, another pastor once told. Pastor Kent Hughes told this story about a man he knew as a young Christian. And he keeps the story anonymous. So just to make things easier, I'm going to call this man Greg. Pastor Kent grew up as a young Christian, seeing Greg as a man who just went above and beyond in service to the Lord. I mean, this guy had just remarkable spiritual gifts of mercy and helps and was eager to help every time. If the doors of the church were open, he was there. Pastor Kent even tells that that Greg rearranged his whole schedule so that in the summers he could go to the local Christian summer camp and serve behind the scenes in every way that they needed help. Like Greg was a man, as Kent put it, who projected a calm and loving spirit. He was himself one of the most loved men in our denomination. And in retrospect, Kent says, I see that he was a master of loving the church. That's how Pastor Kent remembers this man, Greg. And later on, after knowing him for years, seeing his love for the church, Kent learned a little bit of Greg's background. But about a decade earlier, Greg and his wife got to know this man who was in the midst of just a really hard life transition. And they welcomed this other man into their home and said, you can stay with us for as long as you need. We're going to feed you. We're going to clothe you. You are welcome as a part of our family. Please live here. 
And in an unthinkable tragedy, this guest that they invited in actually murdered Greg's daughter. So how did Greg respond? Did he take vengeance? Did he seek to get even? No, what he did week after week was go to the prison and visit his daughter's murderer and share the gospel with him. Week in and week out, sharing the gospel with a man who killed his own daughter. I look at a story like that and I think that has got to be the love of Christ working through that man. No human could ever muster up the strength to love their enemy with that kind of love. That has got to be Christ flowing through that man. But friends, hear this. The very same love of Christ flows through each and every one of us. The same Holy Spirit that that strengthened Greg to love his daughter's murderer is the same Holy Spirit who strengthens you. He does. So keep on relying on him. Keep on leaning on him and seeking to lift high the gospel in how you love your neighbors. For as Paul told us at the beginning of Romans, I am not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. Amen. Let's pray together now. Lord, we need more of you. We need more of your strength flowing through us. Lord, we know that we've been blessed to be a blessing. But God, we confess it can be really difficult to love our neighbor as ourself. So Lord, please help us. Please strengthen us. Please nourish us as we seek to love our neighbor with strength that comes from you. And Lord, we pray again for our brothers and sisters in Christ who are facing persecution throughout the world. We pray for believers in Nigeria, in Haiti, in North Korea, in China, in so many other places. Lord, please be near to them. Please strengthen them. Please help them to endure and respond to the persecution in a way that heaps burning coals on the heads of their persecutors. We pray all this in Jesus' mighty name. Amen.